I might uh, uh, see if Damien's uh, ready to step onto the virtual stage. Are you, are you there, Damien? Uh, yeah, all connected. Yeah, loud and clear. Look, uh, uh, I might get you to share your screen uh, yep. if you like, Damien, whilst I introduce you. But if you haven't heard uh, Damien uh, speak before or listen to his uh, episode on the, on the podcast, um, he's uh, he loves snakes, basically. He loves wetland ecology and wetland health. And he's he's uh, now a uh, post postdoctoral uh, fellow at CSIRO, which I think is the dream gig for a a guy who loves snakes and wetland ecology and, and pollution. Um, but yeah, he did his PhD a few years ago now, I think, isn't it? Um, through Curtin yep. University on wetland health and, and particularly tiger snakes. And if you, and if you like snakes, um, hopefully uh, you'll love the uh, image on the right. I'm sure he's got lots of pictures of snakes. Um, but uh, yeah, and uh, look, on, honestly, uh, this topic that Damien's presenting on today really has really has significant implications to uh, the stormwater industry in particular. Um, it really did blow, blow our minds when we spoke to Damien about this research. Um, uh, and it's and it's fantastic to have him on on the uh, webinar today. And so big thanks to Damien for giving up his time um, today. Uh, and just a reminder, folks, if you do have questions you'd like to ask Damien, uh, please put them in the Q&A. Um, and generally it's the case of first in best dressed. Uh, so if you've got a question, best to come in early. Um, but we'll try our best to get through uh, them all. Um, but without further ado, I might pass you on to, over to my esteemed colleague from CSIRO, Dr. Damien Latouf. Thanks, Brad. Um, good afternoon, everyone on the east side, and good morning if anyone's on the west side. Um, I'm Damien Latouf, as Brad said, a postdoctoral researcher at CSIRO. Uh, and I currently research the impact of chemical pollutants on wildlife. Um, so today I'm going to be presenting a summary of four years worth of tiger snake research, which is assessing broadly the impacts of urbanization on these snakes. Um, give me a second to change slides. Okay. So a bit of background on tiger snakes. Uh, they're what we call a top predator of wetlands. Um, just to specify this term, what I mean is when they're big adults, nothing is predating on them. So they will eat frogs, birds, and mammals. And this means that the health and stability of these snakes is heavily reliant on their prey animals. They're relatively abundant and quite conspicuous. Um, so when we're working with snakes, we have to walk around and hand catch them. There's no trapping available. Uh, and snakes are really good at hiding, but tigers, they're quite big, they're dark colored and they spend their mornings basking on vegetation. So that makes them pretty easy to find. And they do primarily eat frogs when they're living in wetlands. They're known to live in a few other places that don't have frogs. Um, so they will eat birds and mammals, but we're mainly finding frogs in their bellies. Um, they're potentially living for 10 to 15 years in the wild, but this is based off captive animals. We don't really know how long they're living in the wild. And uh, within major cities in the south of Australia, like Perth uh, and Melbourne, for example, or some of the smaller towns, um, they are restricted to these wetland islands. Um, so they're living pretty closely with this ecosystem. They don't really like to go into, into the urban area people's backyard. So they're kind of like bound and stuck to these wetland islands. Um, and what's cool about snakes compared to other animals in the terrestrial uh, space is they have a multi-trophic level life history we call it. So if you look at this rudimentary food web that I've made, um, you can see that tiger snakes, when they're small, they're eating small animals and they are small themselves. So they are prey for larger animals and it takes them a few years to get big enough before they jump up in the trophic level. So having a snake present in the ecosystem, uh, they're providing both prey and a predator role. And all of these characteristics are pretty good for bioindicator species. Um, and so when we say bioindicator species, where we mean a species that's present and health reflects that of the environment that they're living in. Um, now to give a bit of a background to urbanization uh, broadly and what can impact the health of wildlife in urban areas. Quite an obvious one and a focus of today is contaminants. Uh, this is, includes introduced chemicals like pesticides and PFAS. Um, it also includes new or altered nutrient levels, including food scraps for some animals uh, and also things like noise and light. Uh, population genetics and isolation is another impact. 
basically if wildlife can't cross the urban landscape, they get stuck in these patches of habitat and their populations become isolated. And if they're small, they can become inbred. And habitat and resource availability can drastically change in urban landscapes. Um, so we, we did have a master's student working on this for tiger snakes in Perth, uh, but we don't have time to get into those details. Um, so most of my research focused on four sites across Perth that range in urbanization and we knew had good populations of tiger snakes. Um, and that's Herdsman Lake, which is located in the city center in the map. Uh, and that's been urbanized for 150 years. It has a bunch of stormwater drains going into it and one big drain outlet to the ocean. Uh, we've got Bibber and Joondalup lakes located on the edges of the major urban areas. That's uh, down south and up there in the middle. Um, and then Yanchep up the top, which is in a national park that has no urbanization around it. And for a quick introduction of the kind of research and data that I did and what I collected. Um, so the framing of my PhD was to study the impacts of urbanization on tiger snakes and assess their potential use as a bioindicator of wetland condition. And so to do this, I measured a bunch of pollutants, um, four parasites, which is shown in this figure that's up in A, we've got ticks. Um, we've also got tail damage there on the snake. So that tail's a bit shorter than it should be. Um, in B, we've got skin worms that form these little lumps under the skin. In C, those little black dots in the mouth, they're a little trematode. They live in the mouth um, and the throat and the gut. Um, D, you can't see too closely there, but that, that's the tiger snake's stomach, the inside of its stomach, and it's full of nematodes. And that, that burden was as large as my hand. Um, so there was probably over 100 nematodes in there. Um, I looked at wounds on the snakes and some ventral rotting scales and body condition. Um, I also assessed the population genetics and, and links to body condition in snakes from these study sites and an, an additional three snakes. Um, so just to start getting into the data, um, there wasn't a lot of background monitoring information for pollutants in these four wetlands that I picked. So which means I had to go out and do some broad scale screening. Um, I, I looked at the sediment and I looked at the snakes in these sites, particularly the liver, um, which is the best organ to try and pick up a lot of these pollutants. But I also looked in snake scales for metals because metals bind to the scales. Um, and over the course of my research, I looked for over 100 different compounds, including a bunch of common pesticides, hydrocarbons from fuels, uh, PFAS, uh, and a suite of different metals, depending on which analytical technology we could use. And the core finding was we found a bunch of metals accumulating in tiger snake livers uh, and PFAS, which I'll get onto shortly. Um, so in the top figure up here, we can see the snake livers are the black columns and the sediment are the gray columns and they're clustered by the wetland they've come from. Arsenic, cadmium, cobalt, copper, molybdenum, antimony and selenium all show pretty strong correlations between what was in the sediment and what was in the snake i.e. if it was high in one in the sediment, it was high in the snake, uh, the snakes from that wetland. Um, and in the bottom figure where we were looking at metals in the scales, where we took clips from their belly, we were finding these same metals and a few additional metals to be higher in the same wetland populations. Um, so the, the kind of general patterns were herdsman lake snakes that uh, had the highest levels of metals. And this is the wetland from the city center that has over 150 years of urbanization and has the fed water from stormwater drains in a large area. Uh, Herdsman Lake snakes are the left pair of columns in the top graph and the red line in the bottom graph. So the bottom graph uh, is basically how many times higher the metal is compared to tiger snakes that were bred in captivity and haven't been outside. Um, and so we're seeing that, that red line above a lot of the other snakes, but it's not so clear cut. Um, you know, certain lakes have particular metals that, that were higher than the others. Um, and a concerning discovery was that the snakes at Yanchep in the National Park, that's the last pair of columns in the top graph and the green line in the bottom, they generally had the second highest level of a lot of metals, uh, sometimes the highest level of some metals. Um, and after doing some digging, I think I worked out it's likely because the wetland is uh, receding, the water table's 
been altered underneath. So the wetlands receding and it's releasing a lot of these metals that have been trapped in the sediment for thousands of years um, and naturally shouldn't be in those abundances. So it's kind of an indirect impact of urbanization. Um, and we also found tiger snakes have trace amount of a common rat poison in them. Um, I only sampled the three urban sites there. Um, and yeah, we did find traces of rat poison in these snakes. Um, so quickly moving on to the hot topic of PFAS. That's a group of synthetic forever chemicals that are used in a lot of non-stick materials and, and some firefighting foams. On the left, we have PFAS in water samples from these sites, and we can see pretty similar total levels uh, between Herdsman Lake and Joondalup Lake. Um, Herdsman Lake being the old urban site again, and Joondalup being on the edge, but it has some nearby fire stations. And even though the mixtures are slightly different, uh, Herdsman Lake had the most PFOS, which is generally coming from these old firefighting foams. Um, we also found no PFAS in the Yanchep National Park waters. And when we looked in the snake livers in the graph on the right, so this is what was in the snakes, uh, we found that it's mainly PFOS that's accumulating. Um, this compound is known to bind to organic material and is the common one found in wildlife around the world. Um, and so we're finding most of the levels is, is PFOS and high strong site level correlation. So highest in Herdsman Lake snakes, uh, then Joondalup and very small amounts in Bibber Lake and only trace amounts in a couple of snakes from Yanchep. So, sorry, this figure doesn't look that exciting at the moment. Um, what do all these accumulated contaminants mean for the snakes? Um, the first difficulty is we found lots of contaminants measured in not a very large sample size of snakes to be able to work out how each contaminant works independently. Um, and this is a common issue for ecotox studies in wild animals. Um, you can go and look for one target compound like mercury or a particular PFAS, but you're ignoring all these other kind of mixtures and co uh, cocktails that exist out there. And then when you start to measure them all, you realize that each snake kind of has its own unique mixture and pattern and, and these sites do, and it's quite hard. The statistical tools we have available aren't uh, that powerful to kind of work out how they all interact with each other. So I've decided to pull the metals together into a pollution index, which basically uh, it kind of adds them together and assumes that they're having like an additive response. Um, and I also pulled PFAS together into total PFAS concentration, which essentially is doing the same thing. Uh, and then I modeled these against a heap of these health and condition variables that I've had mentioned earlier. And I measured this in over 350 individual snakes across these four sites. And so kind of working backwards on what I found, um, I didn't find any relationship between this metal pollution index uh, or PFAS and on any of the parasites, um, the infections or the wound counts. Uh, I calculated an urbanization metric for the wetland. So that's kind of degree of urban landscape within the wetland. And this wasn't associated with any health parameter either. Um, I didn't find any difference in how much food was in the snake's bellies. Um, so I got to count what the snakes were eating and, and how much food they had. And we use this as a measure of how much food's available in the wetland and also with the feeding ability of these snakes because some contaminants have shown to make animals want to feed less. So we found they were eating the same amount of food across all these sites. Um, I didn't find any difference in how quick the snakes were growing between the sites as well. And I could do this because I went out three years in a row and sometimes I would catch the same snakes and got to measure them. So they were all kind of growing at similar rates across sites. Um, but a key finding I did find was a significant decrease in body condition in snakes with higher metals. And that is basically a weight to body length measurement. And so if a snake has low condition, it has less body fat and smaller muscles. Um, and now because I've shown that these snakes were eating the same amount of food, but they're not maintaining this body condition in the higher metal sites. Uh, we think it can be from an investment of energy into detoxifying these metals um, and an increase in metabolism, which has been shown in reptiles exposed to some of these metals. So basically the snakes are burning more fuel than they should be. Um, and then I found the same pattern with total PFAS. Snakes with more PFAS have lower body condition. Um, and the PFAS study 
we also got to do a metabolomic assessment on several organs, um, which is a very fine scale biochemical assessment. And we found that in the muscle, the snakes with higher PFAS had changes in energy production and cellular maintenance pathways. Um, so that's kind of helping us understand what the PFAS is doing and why we're seeing snakes with lower muscle condition in these sites. Um, and then a pattern I found pretty interesting was when I combined all the health metrics, that's parasites, body condition, tail, uh, these sorts of things uh, into a single metric and I compare these snakes with each other. So that's this PCA plot that just showed up in the, the middle here. Um, basically each dot is a snake and each circle is a wetland. So Herdsman Lake in the pink, uh, all the snakes from Herdsman Lake had very similar health profiles. And this was driven by low body condition, high tail loss and a low number of parasites. So you pick a snake from Herdsman Lake uh, and likely their body condition from anywhere in the lake, uh, their health condition, sorry, is going to be quite similar. Whereas you catch snakes from those other three sites and they've got a huge range of different um, health conditions, which you would expect in a wild population. Um, quickly to cover some genetic health of these snakes as well. Uh, we sampled a couple of extra populations here. We've, we've got um, two more sites south of mine in Perth and we've got Karnak Island, which is a island population off the coast of Perth. Um, we found that closely related snakes, uh, sites that weren't recently urbanized are closely related. So that's this figure in the top right. Um, Basically, all those dots, again, are a snake and they've got a different symbol for their population. So things like Yanchep and Joondalup, they're coming up closely related. And if you look at that map, you can see there is still a big green space in between there. So it's showing that gene flow exists between these sites. But Herdsman Lake sticking out by itself. It's been isolated for a long time. So that population is, is kind of showing up like a true island. Um, and same with Karnak, which is a true island. So that makes sense. Um, populations north of the river. So you can see this big river divide goes through Perth. They have lower genetic diversity. That's Herdsman Lake, Joondalup and Yanchep. Um, and what this means is they can be less likely to adapt to change like climate or increased pollution. Um, and as it warms, you know, that northern population is going to be impacted and urbanisation is higher in the north. So, uh, you know, they're more susceptible to not being able to adapt with lower genetic diversity. Um, and then I found that more isolated sites like Herdsman Lake and Karnak, um, they did have some signals of inbreeding, but at this current time, they're pretty low. And that's this little red box um, figure that's come up. It's, it's just a calculation of inbreeding. So they, they were picked up, but it's super low. Um, and over the course of three years of field and lab work on tiger snakes, I did get to find out a couple of extra interesting things about the system on the side. Um, so when I was, doing my liver testing studies. Three of the snakes I euthanized were in earlier stages of pregnancy. So I took advantage of this sacrifice and I tested the babies as well as the mothers. Uh, and we did find patterns of maternal transfer of um, manganese, molybdenum, antimony, arsenic, mercury, and zinc. High in the mums, high in the babies. Um, I got to find a couple of interesting things in snake bellies. So a baby bandicoot, which is shown in the picture on the right, um, and a baby turtle, which I don't have a photo of, but this was the, I think, second published record we could find of a, a snake eating a baby freshwater turtle in Australia. Um, I found a part of a bottle cap, which is shown in the picture on the left. Um, and so basically this bottle cap got stuck in the lower parts of the snake's digestive system to the point where it punctured through the skin and the snake was found dead. Um, and we got to watch a snake swim away from us and go underwater and hold its breath for 18 minutes, which was quite a fun exercise. Uh, so just to kind of summarize the key findings from all this research so far is that tiger snakes are accumulating a suite of chemical contaminants and we are seeing a change in impact on their health. Um, as tiger snakes are top predators and get most of their contaminants from their prey, this means uh, similar predators in the food web should also be contaminated and more sensitive species like certain birds and frogs should be assessed and monitored in these wetlands and ur similar urban wetlands because these contaminants are common across urban wetlands. Um, and terrestrial vertebrate ecotox research is pretty understudied in Australia. So that's our land species, uh, marine and freshwater fish and some wetland birds get a bit of research. Um, 
but there's many other species living in these environments. We know nothing about the impact from their pollution, which makes the field really difficult uh, and it is expensive to do, which doesn't help. Um, however, now I'm currently working on uh, f assessing frogs around Perth and Brisbane. I have collected cane toads from six sites around Perth along a PFAS gradient. Um, and I've collected motorbike frogs, which is the main tiger snake prey from my four tiger snake sites. And then an additional um, eight sites along a stronger PFAS gradient. So we're going to be finding out what the PFAS and metals levels are like in the snake's food from these sites and more sites around Perth to really kind of understand what's happening in urban wetland spaces um, and frogs. And I have to give thanks to a lot of the people that were involved uh, in all this research and the future stuff coming along. Um, there was a lot of people here and I couldn't have done it without everyone. It's a very multidisciplinary research subject. Um, and we'll wrap it up there and go into some Q&A. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Damien. Fascinating as always. Uh, I've got a few questions that have come through already, but just a reminder, folks, if you do have uh, any questions you'd like to ask Damien uh, in the webinar forum today, yeah, please put them in the Q&A panel. Um, I'll go uh, very early on. I think um, David Lowe asked a question, and this is a this is something I only found out just recently with the recent podcast we did with Matt Landos. Yeah, he goes, uh, FYI, uh, pesticide, pesticides contain PFAS molecules. So source might be from pesticides as well. Um, were you aware of that, Damien? Um, um, I wasn't, but I'm not surprised seeing yeah. where PFAS shows up. Um, mm. And I guess I didn't have time to elaborate, but I guess my research focuses a lot more on what's ending up in the animals and mm. impact and not as much as source. So yeah. that's just something I didn't have a time, mm. time, you yeah. know, you've got to really go exploring the environment a lot more if you want to try and track down where these things are coming from. I think you did enough yeah. exploring, catching a whole bunch of tiger snakes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and actually just to clarify on the source of PFAS, there was, I remember there was one fire station within one of the lakes uh, catchments wasn't there, but the others didn't have any sort of really obvious sources of PFAS contamination, like a fire station, an airport, military ground, et cetera. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So uh, that would be Joondalup has, has mm. a fire station nearby, um, but not as long-term historic exposure, mm. whereas Herzman Lake has a lot more uh, stormwater coming from a broad urban landscape. Yeah. Yeah, yeah interesting. Um, Mazib Araman asks, uh, did you tag the snakes or uh, you had a def different mechanism to identify them during the study? Yeah. So I would clip their belly scales in a certain pattern um, and then we would retain the scale. So we could use the scales for both genetics and the heavy metal testing. Um, so it worked out really well. Every snake I caught, I got to give it a number. And that's how I knew when I caught them again the following year or even in the same season um, who it was. And, and I could kind of work out how far they're moving and, yeah, how much they're growing and things. Cool. I uh, can't imagine you're too popular in the snake community around Perth wetlands, but uh, <laughs> I, I, David also asks, uh, I would be interested in, I would interest, I'd be interested to correlate PFAS containing pesticide use by conservation authorities often used to control unwanted plants in water in Perth area with degeneration of snake health uh, would be connected to health of food source, e.g. frogs. Um, yeah, I guess if the thing with these tox studies, um, and when you're talking about wetlands where they're applying particular chemicals frequently in known sites, um, you've got two ways of doing it. You, you either go out to that site and you catch a lots of animals and mm. try and get tissues from them or, or euthanize them to get the, the better tissues inside. Um, or you could do a, lab exposure experiment where you know those chemicals that are being used and you could get those animals in captivity and expose them just to that, um, mm. which is probably a little bit better uh, if you want to answer that question. Because if you're talking about PFAS introduced with pesticides and you're looking in a PFAS contaminated site, it, you wouldn't be able to tell yeah. unless there are a particular PFAS compound associated just with that um, pesticide yeah. and not one that is introduced by other things. Yeah. Uh, a question from Rohan Bajraha 
Charia, apologies, I've mispronounced it, I'm sure. Uh, they ask, does Yanchep have agricultural uh, land catchment, which may be contributing to the high metal concentrations? Yeah, and that um, I did include that hypothesis in the, my research outputs. Um, so if you follow the direction of groundwater flow upstream, uh, there is kind of historic agriculture use um, it's it's patchy and and some of it's still in agriculture use and some wasn't has now been turned to plantation or, mm. or reclaimed by national park so yeah that's definitely a potential mm. uh, another question from Mazib Rahman uh, uh, asks uh, I think it's almost another PhD uh, maybe Damien but uh, did you do any predicted predicted sorry did you do any prediction modeling on the species population decline with the increase in the contaminant levels yeah good question so um we did get a master's student to attempt to do that. Uh, they've just wrapped up. Um, it's quite difficult because to do mark recapture and systematic surveys for tiger snakes uh, or for most snakes is quite difficult because um, we wanted to randomize when they go walking the transect, so different times a day. Um, and the snakes don't cooperate like that. They like to come out when they want to come out at this particular time of day and you can miss that window. So I had really good success because I didn't care about when I was going out. I just went, this is the best time of day and this is the best weather conditions. I'm going to this spot and I caught them. But when you're doing, you have to do 30 minutes, one kilometer transect at this time of day and it's the wrong time, the snakes don't come out. So we found the capture rates and the mark remarking rates uh, were very low um, which made the models not fit that well. Um, and to do it properly, you would just need a big team of people really um, that know how to find and catch these snakes and, and kind of get the ball rolling that way. So I'm very interested in that. And that's something I would like to stay on top of, but working with snakes is, is just quite difficult in that area. Yeah. I think it's hard enough. Um, we'll move on. Uh, Rowan asks another question. Uh, also, how can council... Uh, how can council help in regard to this study? Uh, wetland design follow best practice guidelines to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus, but what can be done to reduce those high metals? Yeah, this is probably something we talked about in the podcast, Dan, you might remember, was a lot of uh, councils, uh, regulators uh, encourage the application or integration of wetlands, uh, constructed wetlands downstream of urban environments to help remove pollution uh, from the uh, the catchment before it discharges downstream, but obviously these wetlands are becoming essentially, from my perspective, like a an ecological trap. Uh, that they encourage uh, wildlife to come to the wetland by by virtue by virtue it's got plants and water, etc. But by doing so, uh, it also seems to make these wildlife that is attracted quite ill. Um, so, how, what what would you suggest from a council or a or a catchment management perspective to maybe mitigate this risk yeah that's um that's a tricky one i think that's a bit more up your alley if you're talking about preventing water mm. you know stormwater management or water inflow that's that's one issue stopping the new pollution mm. coming in it's not definitely not my area of expertise i'm not as much a chemist i'm more of a biologist mm. um but you know i guess if you're trying to remediate an already contaminated area uh, you have to be looking at some bioremediation practices, mm. um, certain plants to be able to pull these things out of sediments and water uh, is one way. Um, obviously, replacing this contaminated sediment and water is another method, but a massive job. Um, so, yeah, I guess you've got to tackle it from two ways. You've got to try and stop new pollution coming in mm. and work out what's the most cost effective and efficient way to get rid of that pre-existing contamination. Because um, like you said, Brad, it's sometimes these wetlands are made for the purpose of being a pollution sink mm. basin and and it's not um that's the wildlife end up there because it's a good um wetland for them and then other times it is just accidental contamination from being in an urban space so it's a very mm. difficult place to work in um especially from the land managers and stakeholders yeah. managing it it's a, it, it really has big implications to the stormwater industry, like this um, strategy of just putting in wetlands downstream of urban environments to capture pollution but also attract wildlife. Um, is I, I think it's fundamentally flawed. Uh, if we want to attract wildlife and provide a safe habitat for the species or various species, 
we need to stop pollution from going in there. Um, so that means not just treatment devices, um, but you know, ensuring that there isn't a, a, an, um, a, an inappropriate level of pollution going into the system, whether it's at source management, you know, making sure you're not using PFAS laden pesticides as one example, um, uh, amongst other things. So, but I think this blanket strategy of putting in wetlands downstream of urban environments is, is, is fundamentally flawed. Um, we can come back to that if you like, but um, there are a bunch of questions still coming through. Um, Josh Keane uh, says uh, he, might have missed, he might have missed whether you covered it, but did you find larger individuals had higher concentrations of heavy metals slash PFAS than small individuals? Uh, yeah, so good question. I didn't share that slide. Um, so we found a opposite relationship in males and females, which is quite common in pollutants that bioaccumulate so males as they get bigger have more PFAS because their their bodies uh, are taking in more than they can get rid of so as the snakes get bigger yep they have a higher concentration but females because a lot of these PFAS PFOS specifically um, binds to lipids and things when they're growing babies they're passing a lot of this into the baby so there's a strong pattern of maternal transfer so as the females quite often get bigger they've had more you know, litters of babies as time goes on. Um, so it's an opposite pattern. And this is shown in a lot of wildlife. Yeah, cool. Um, another question from, uh, uh, sorry, question from Faye, Faye Grease. Apologies if I've mispronounced this. Uh, they say, how come the urbanization was not associated with any health parameter, although the water pattern in the lake might change due to urbanization and landscaping areas? Yeah, good question. I think uh, probably the metric I used for urbanization wasn't the best. Uh, that was just a landscape level assessment, basically like a ratio of how much concrete there was to, you know, disturbed vegetation, natural vegetation. Um, another thing that didn't help me answer that question properly is I only had four sites. So I only had four different degrees of, of urbanization. And maybe if I had 12 sites, um, we might've been able to actually see um, common patterns because what's happening is all four of these wetlands, even though they're uh, kind of enclosed water bodies and they look comparable on a map, when you actually go out and get on foot, you realize they're actually quite different ecosystems themselves. You know, one's completely enclosed and is just ephemeral. Uh, rains coming in and out. We've got Herdsman Lake that's fed water constantly. You've got Joondalup, that's a massive deep lake that has a couple of drains going into it. And then you've got Yanchep, which is groundwater fed. So uh, if you're talking about parasites and, and health metrics and things, they can be changed by a whole bunch of different things in these ecosystems. And I've, I'm looking at four different lakes that um, you know, are fundamentally a little bit different themselves. Um, yeah, so... Basically, I don't think I got to assess that as robust as I would have liked. Mm. Uh, David Lowe uh, has commented uh, about your comment on pesticides. He goes, yeah, an interesting answer on the pesticides. It is problematic to gather evidence to that pesticides uh, cause harm when mixed in with so many other contaminants, hence inactions. Uh, difficult, yeah. difficult PhD topic for sure, Damien. But yeah, they, they, these yeah. the wetland environment is, is seemingly a, a chemical cocktail and and I, and I look yeah. at when you when you're showing in particular, you are showing the PFAS concentrations in the various water bodies. Um, you can, if you want, I don't know if you want to get that slide up, but the concentrations yeah, okay. back, huh? are crazy low. Like uh, it was micrograms per liter, like 0.00. I can't remember what it was now, Damien. Um, there you go. Okay. Point like 0.1, generally less than 0.125 micrograms per liter. I mean that's a that's a teaspoon in an Olympic size swimming pool. And and these levels are actually I, I looked up the uh the guideline levels for uh, PFAS. Even in drinking water, the the, the recommended limit for PFAS and, and pH excess is the sum of PFOS and uh PH, PFHX is um a 0.07 microgram per liter. So that's actually kind of comparable to your lake levels, which are showing that snakes, which is a very, very hardy species, are getting sick because of that PFAS contamination. But the, the guideline level for drinking water is is similar, 0.07 micrograms per litre for the sum of PFAS and PFHX. Like, uh, it begs the question, like, 
like it's a bizarre like these concentrations are so low but you're finding an impact to the the species which begs the question and i don't want to put you on the spot because i know it's a very difficult question to ask but what is a safe level for pfas in uh drinking water or, or wetland environments maybe whammy wetland environments you might be more qualified to comment on that yeah i um again i've because i've been focusing more on biological impact i guess i focus more on what's in the animal and mm -hmm. so we're looking at what are these concentrations in the animal and then and working backwards to try and compare that to what you see in a snapshot of a water sample mm. um in a wetland is quite difficult um so i don't think uh you know we provide a snapshot when we do these studies but to do a proper assessment of what that each wetland is getting over time you know especially if they're stormwater fed so you might get mm. influxes at certain time of year is maybe this value actually isn't an accurate representation of what the entire landscape is exposed to there which makes it uh yeah i think the focus is if you want to look at where things are coming from and, and what your kind of average or um range of exposure in a particular wetland is that's when you've got to be doing repeat measurements over time um, but the difficult thing with contaminants that are persistent and bioaccumulate which are the ones i focus on is you might look at this water snapshot and go right on this day at this particular part of the lake that i've sampled this is our very small measurement um and maybe the wildlife or those living there drink that once in their life and then mm clean water comes through and they're never exposed to it again but if they're getting that every single day that's probably when it starts to translate into these bioaccumulation levels and and persistent pollutants that bioaccumulate are very difficult to create guideline values for because yeah. you can sample it on one day and you don't know how that's going to translate for an animal that spends 20 years of their life drinking yeah. that every single day um, versus one like a bird that's just flown through um so I've I've kind of just dodged around that question because I can't actually answer that <laughs> properly. Um, that's okay. That's okay. No, it's a really hard question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but this, but this generally, um, because I have been working now with the feds a little bit in in helping generate these guidelines, is it's really difficult because yeah. you can't you can't predict what that number means, how that number translates into like top predators, especially, uh, you know, it could, that number can mean one thing for some invertebrates that live in that lake uh, and maybe a small frog. And then, you know, to a wedge tailed eagle that is decades old. Um, yeah. We just don't know what those levels end up as. It's staggering. And David last made a comment on biomagnification. Like um, if, if I take anything away from this study is that you want to eat low on the food chain. Hey, I got, I've been vegan for 10 years. There's no way I'm going to eat any more uh, any meat or fish or anything like that. Um, yep. uh, sorry, I, I see Osgur. Um, you've, you've put your hand up. I, I actually, if you want to say something uh, or comment uh, or ask a question verbally uh, with your audio on, you'll have to unmute yourself. So you can talk if you like, but you will have to unmute yourself. Um, I'll give you a couple of seconds to do that. But if you're not ready, I might ch ch charge on the next question. Uh, Danny Hay Hayworth asks, and it's similar to the cop, the, the uh, I think the topic we talked about before, Danny asks, uh, constructed wetlands um, can be used for the removal of contaminants prior to discharge to the oceans or reuse. Uh, it's probably, I don't know. I think the question for me, if I'm honest, um, Damien, you can give it a crack, but they ask, do you have any design recommendations to reduce the impact? Uh, yeah, I'm going to handle that to you. Okay. Look, um, as I sort of mentioned before, Danny, like I, I really think, uh, I think you need to know the problem first. Uh, I think you need to, if you're looking at uh, using, treating or reusing or discharging stormwater, you need to know what the the quality of that water is. Um, and historically, we, very few groups have looked at PFAS, uh, if I'm honest. So it's it's what's designated as an emerging contaminant, even though it's been around since the 1970s. I think we're just getting our head around the magnitude of the problem. And I think we're just completely underestimating it as well. But that's a side note. Um, but as I mentioned before, I'd really recommend uh, looking at the water quality, sampling and analysing, seeing what the contamination levels are, but also doing whatever is necessary to reduce PFAS and other contaminant uh, generation. So reducing PFAS at the source, like I said, don't use PFAS laden pesticides, seasonally hot spots, et cetera. And maybe if there is residual PFAS or other contamination, do pre-treatment upstream of any wetlands uh, so that would be my number one recommendation um oscar uh, you've still uh, allowed to talk but um 
I think you're, uh, if you if you can't unmute yourself, we might charge on. But that's actually the uh, end of the formal questions. Uh, Damien, I might get, get you to go back to your slide with your um, with your contact details. Um, yep. Just so, but for people uh, who are keen to uh, reach out and ask Damien further questions, um, sorry, Oscar. I, I, yeah, I just saw your uh, microphone doesn't work. Maybe if you just want to type your question in the Q and A, oh. we can. Or comment in the Q and A. We can I, I can read it out to everyone. Um, but look, if people are, are keen to uh, reach out to Damien and find out more, um, please do so. His contact details are on the on the screen as we speak. Um, but look, on behalf of everyone who's come in today, and uh, I'd like to, and on behalf of Ocean Protect, I'd just like to thank Damien for an amazing presentation. It is a it's an incredible topic. It's an incredible body of work that you've put together. Very difficult. I don't think it's beyond, it's certainly beyond me. I, I don't want to go chasing around tiger snakes in, in long grass and wetland environments and, and doing an analysis like that. But uh, hats off to you for doing it. Uh, the world is better for your study, uh, Damien. And uh, really look forward to seeing what your, uh, what the next study is. I, I know you you mentioned you've, you're looking at a whole bunch of uh, frogs and, and toads around Brisbane and Perth and You've just booked yourself a spot for the next um, podcast and webinar to talk about that that study as well. So that'll be fascinating as well. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Brad. Thanks for the continuous support. Anytime. Well, again, thank you, Damien. Great work. Keep up, keep up the awesome work. And I look forward to seeing everyone uh, in person sometime soon. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Damien.